So we are going to start with the last talk of this session, which is about multi-qubit lattice surgery scheduling. So this joint work with Silva, Webb, Yang, Lemieux, Scherer, Zhang, Kramer, Liu, Chen, Renag, and Alison Silva will give a talk. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alison Silva. I'm a full-time scientist with a background in operations research uh, working at OneQubit, which is a quantum computing software company based in Canada, uh, where this research was developed with a multidisciplinary team of quantum researchers and software developers. Uh, today, I'm going to present the, our paper titled Multi-Qubit Lattice Surgery Scheduling. I will begin with a short summary of our work, and I will detail the research that we conducted, culminating the key takeaways uh, derived from our observations. So here's a summary of our research. Uh, in it, we explored the optimization of multi-qubit lattice surgery, uh, which is a promising uh, technique that can be used to perform logical operations by connecting distant qubits in topological error, co uh, error correcting codes. A problem arising from lattice surgery is the lattice surgery scheduling problem, as we call, or LSSP, as I'm going to use in short in the rest of the presentation. Uh, in this problem, we need to make decisions related to the order, this basically the sequencing of the, uh, in which the uh, logical operations in a quantum circuit should be executed, and also the logical research, uh, the laws, sorry, the logical res uh, resources required to entangle uh, the qubits requested uh, by each one of these operations using lattice surgery. Uh, we model mathematically this problem and use a, a heuristic solution for it because of the scalability requirements uh, to solve it. And then we run uh, our algorithms to generate a scheduling for operations uh, of circuits that were generated inspired by real uh, possible real applications. So we could investigate metrics such as the expected runtime needed to execute these operations and the parallelization potential of, of the operations in these circuits. Uh, we also analyzed the trade-offs in the scheduling of these circuits after a, oops, sorry, after a transpilation algorithm uh, that is known in the literature uh, that reduces the number of uh, logical gates in circuits at the cost of increasing uh, their weights, basically the number of uh, qubits requested by each one of them. So in a brief summary here uh, about topological codes and logical qubits, uh, first of all, probably most of you should know about this, but fault-tolerant quantum computation aims to ensure reliable uh, quantum computing despite the presence of the current uh, faulty physical qubits. Uh, so the solution uh, for it is using quantum error correction codes, uh, which presents some techniques, including the topological codes, for enabling uh, this uh, fault-tolerant quantum computation. Two-dimensional uh, topological codes encode, usually encodes quantum information into logical qubit patches, uh, similar to these ones that you see on the side, uh, which are protected using uh, rounds of parity checks. So basically we get like a single a physical qubit, we arranged in a or organized way to form a patch that I'm gonna be representing by these squares here. And these patches are located uh, in a two-dimensional two lattice, which is similar to a chessboard, you can uh, say like that. And they occupy tiles, which can be like a single tile, such as this one, or maybe two tiles, such as this one. Or we can even have like some other combinations, such as two qubits occupying a single patch, but in two tiles. Uh, talking about the circuits that needs to be scheduled, uh, the arrow uh, lattice surgery considered uh, requires that all logical operations are in the form of polyrotation measurements. A polyrotation measurement is represented by a poly operator, P, as you see here, uh, and a rotation angle, theta, as you can see on the side, which for the code considered must, must either be a pi-4 rotation or a pi-8 rotation. Uh, operations in other gate sets, such as, for example, the Clifford plus T uh, universal gate set, can be easily converted to polyrotations using these uh, conversion uh, rules. And other gates, such as, for example, arbitrary uh, angle rotations, can be approximated using the composition techniques, but this is beyond the scope of my talk here. So uh, we are given a circuit composed of polyrotation measurements on the side. Uh, 
that can be represented as a matrix where each one of the rows uh, represent a single uh, rotation that needs to be performed and the columns represent each one of the qubits requested by, by them. By defining a commutation rule, for example, as a, a, a the trivial commutation rule, uh, we can build a graph that we call as a dependency graph, representing the dependency constraints for the execution of these operations. So for example, in the trivial rule, as I mentioned, uh, it, may, it says basically that, uh, let me get one example here. So for the second operation and the third operation, uh, given that they do not share a single qubit uh, requested, so for example, first qubit is only requested by this one, second is only requested by the second one, and so on, remembering that the identity operation, we consider that that means it's not requested, then that means that two and three could be executed in parallel, in theory, because they commute. So uh, in this example here, as I mentioned, like two and three can be executed in parallel, one, no, four, no, that means that we have four operations, but the depth of the circuit is three. With that, we define a metric, uh, which we call the average width of this dependency graph, that defines the parallelization potential of the circuit. In this case, four divided by three, 1.33. So lattice surgery in topological codes uh, means that a multi-qubit logical gate between adjacent two-dimensional topological uh, patches involves multiple rounds of parity checks. So lattice surgery can be executed by measuring stabilizers between the edges of the logical patches, meaning that we only need to create like these kind of connections between the patches of the qubits that are requested in the circuit as I showed before, in order to perform that operation. So I give here one example of how this is done, uh, just a simple example so you can understand. So, Let's say we have like these two operations, uh, a pi four rotation, a pi eight rotation, sorry, requesting the y and y operators of the qubits two and three, and a pi four rotation requesting the x of first qubit and z uh, of the fourth qubit. Uh, in order to perform these two operations in parallel, we need to generate like the ancilla patch, as we called for the lattice surgery, using the quantum bus, which are these green tiles here that connects these qubits, so qubit two, qubit three. And because this is a pi eight rotation, it needs to, put qubit, uh, to connect to a magic state storage qubit using only the quantum bus. And none of the bus, uh, the bus tiles uh, could be shared by the same uh, Scylla patch. So if this is possible, then we can guarantee that these operations can be executed in parallel. So given the circuit and the topological layout, we can define the lattice surgery scheduling problem. Uh, in overall, when we are designing any uh, fault-tolerant quantum uh, device, we should optimize space and time costs. Space costs really, uh, refers to the quantity and arrangement and possibly other measurements uh, that are related to the, to the qubits, to the logical and the physical qubits, while the time cost uh, refers to the expected runtime for the whole circuit. So given a topological code layout representing where the operations will be executed, uh, the, the lattice surgery scheduling problem tries to minimize the expected circuit execution time by searching the operations that can be performed in parallel. Uh, also, this problem, when we are solving it, uh, indirectly reduces the, the space costs because uh, we are trying to generate uh, uh, ancilla patches for the lattice surgery that are of the smallest size as possible. And because we are using fewer qubits, that will may end up like resulting in smaller encoding requirements for the logical qubits in the end. Uh, we searched in the literature about this problem and we found that this is not new. Uh, there are like many studies that solve this problem uh, in the literature, but they usually consider only the connection between two qubits, so pair of qubits. This is relatively easy to solve uh, from an optimization uh, point of view because this requires solving shortest path, shortest path problems to parallelize the, the, these gates. But I will show later that because of the transpilation algorithm that we run, uh, there are like a higher likelihood that the operations will become like larger, we require multiple qubits. And for that, for generating the connections between these multiple qubits, we are required to solve three, uh, sorry, uh, shortest three problems. Okay, so this is considered, this is a classical NP hard problem in the optimization. 
All right, so given the problem, uh, we first try to model mathematically uh, it. Uh, don't worry about this math here. This is just like a candy for the math, loader, math lovers. But what is important for you to get from it is that we can decompose this problem uh, between two different, uh, let's say, like models. The first one, like the higher level model, is what we call the sequencing decisions, is what uh, does the sequencing decisions. In this model, we are interested in minimizing the number of packs of operations that can be scheduled in parallel, where a pack represents like a set of operations that uh, ref uh, respect the, the, that does not involve any contradictions uh, regarding the commutation rules. And given a certain pack of operations that are candidates, we try to solve the sub problem that generates the, the, the trees that connects the qubits that are requested by each one of these operations and seek for a uh, feasible solution for these packs. Also uh, minimizing the number of, uh, the number of bus tiles that are used for the, the construction of these trees. So in a quick example here, uh, again, given the trivial rule, these two operations here commute. So they, that means that this is a candidate pack uh, for the primary problem. So when I go to the sub problem, I need to generate like two unsealed patches, one for each one of them that connects all the qubits requested. And if it's possible, if there is no bump between the sealed patches, we have a feasible solution. Uh, the problem with that model is that it requires uh, generating all the combinations of packs, which is increases exponentially. Uh, and this is very costly computationally. So instead of that, and because we need to schedule like millions of operations even more on a real uh, quantum circuit, we developed the a heuristic algorithm, very simple one, a greedy heuristic as we call, to solve this problem using no methods from, from the optimization point. Uh, so we are given first uh, here uh, as an input, the circuit that needs to be scheduled in the form of a dependency graph and the, the adjacency graph representing the adjacencies between the logical qubits in the lattice. So we identify uh, the dependencies among the operations to build the dependency graph. And then we run a loop where we identify the candidate packs from the dependency graph. So in this case, uh, the candidate pack will be composed of all the operations that are the root nodes of this uh, dependency graph. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, and then for these candidate uh, operations here, uh, we generate the trees connecting the qubits that they request. So for example, here, I need to, I need to connect like the X operator on the qubit two, so this one here, and the Y operator on qubit three, so uh, Y is basically X and Z. And because this is a pi four rotation, I'm connecting to an ancillary qubit here on the side. So for that, we solve a standard three problem, which as I mentioned before, is a classical NP hard problem. And this example here, I only have one operation to be packed, but if I had another one, I could just remove like these nodes that were used and search for, uh, solve again this uh, standard tree problem for the remainder of the operations given the updated uh, adjacency graph. So we repeat this operation multiple times for the getting, always updating the dependency graph to grab, to grab like the next uh, candidate pack. Again, like every time that, these are scheduled, I remove these operations, I repeat this loop here again, and in the end, we expect to return the operations that were scheduled, given a certain uh, order, and the trees generated for these uh, multi-qubit operations. So for the computational experiments uh, we perform, uh, that we performed, we generated uh, random circuits, and as I mentioned before, like real world inspired uh, circuits using Hamiltonian simulation. Uh, here's a list of the uh, applications that we consider. I'm not a specialist on uh, quantum algorithms, so uh, if you want to ask anything about it, probably I won't know the, the answer. But uh, from this list here, we generated circuits with up to 18 million poly rotations and up to 50 logical qubits, uh, data qubits. So basically these uh, purple tiles here. And to facilitate parallelization between the operations, we consider this layout for the algorithmic area, the core of the, de the, the device, uh, because we have like multiple ways to connect uh, the, the different qubits using the quantum bus. 
Before I show you uh, results about the ex our experiments, I want to briefly talk about the transpilation algorithm that we uh, run and which inspired the development of this method. Uh, this transpilation algorithm is inspired by this study here, the Lintisky 2019. Uh, it's relatively simple. So we get the input circuit composed of Pi4 operations and Pi8 operations. And then we perform these three steps to remove the, all the Pi4, all the Clifford operations from the circuit, and to try to reduce the number of uh, Pi8, the non-Clifford operations from it. So first we push all the Pi4 rotations, so we perform a sort of like sorting algorithm here. Then we reduce the number of Pi4 and Pi8 layers by uh, combining operations whenever it's possible. And finally, we commute Pi4 rotations past the uh, qubit measurements, of course, updating these qubit measurements in order to uh, end up with a circuit like that. Uh, that has a reduced length. One known uh, feature of this algorithm is that when we are uh, doing this first operation here, pushing the Pi-4 rotations, uh, I have an example here for like Pi-4s here and Pi-8s here. When we do the commutations for the, for the Pi-8s, they tend to become uh, like heavier. So they tend to require more qubits once I commute them. So uh, in the literature, I brought like this quotation, this citation here that highly parallel input circuits can become serialized with prohibitive runtimes uh, because of this uh, algorithm. So we investigated this affirmation by running our greedy algorithm for circuits before and after transpilation and comparing the solutions uh, obtained for the scheduling problem. And the results are summarized here. So let me briefly go over them. So. The first one that you see, the circuit length, refers to the number of operations in the circuit. So you can see that on average, we had 5 million operations before transpilation, and we end up with 500,000 uh, 500, approximately, which means a 89% reduction on average. Uh, circuit length is composed of Pi 4s and Pi 8s. I'm ignoring the, the measurements for now. Uh, and I just want to show you here that uh, after transpilation, we remove all the Pi 4 operations. But we also reduce the number of Pi-8 operations, which is good because these are the costly part of uh, photo-learned quantum computation, by 72% after running this uh, algorithm. Again, as the literature knows, as this is vastly known, uh, the number of qubits requested by operation increases after running the transpilation. Consequently, the parallelization potential average width of the circuit decreases because we have like fewer parallelization opportunities. But we show that despite of this reduction in parallelization potential, the reduction on the circuit length outperforms this. So we end up like with 80%, 87% reduction in the number of logical cycles to execute all the operations remaining in the circuit. Uh, sorry. Uh, this, last one, this second last one here is just like the wall clock time. I just want to show that the problem becomes much easier to solve. Uh, the scheduling problem becomes much easier to solve after transpilation as well. Again, because we have like a smaller circuit and because we have fewer par parallelization opportunities. But something very interesting is that even uh, despite of like running the, the, the transpilation or not, there are like uh, parallelization opportunities in both circuits as we observed. So in the pre-transpired circuit, we observed that Comparing this solution here, the number of logical cycles, to the circuit length, we could still uh, paralyze approximately 37% of the operations. And even after transpilation, we could still paralyze 21% of the operations. And some other inter very interesting thing that we observed is that the lower bound solution for the scheduling problem for the pre-transpired circuits, meaning the circuit depth, is still higher than the upper bound solution for the scheduling problem for the post-transpilot circuits. So that means that even if we could not paralyze any operation in the post transpired circuit, that would still mean that the, the number of logical cycles for the post transpired circuit would be reduced uh, compared to non transpired circuits. So in conclusion, I just want you to take like these two takeaways from this presentation. The first one is that solving this uh, problem, this lattice surgery scheduling problem helps to reduce uh, space-time costs when designing fault-tolerant uh, devices. The second one is that, again, as I just showed, transpilation reduces the parallelization of a quantum circuit, 
but it can also significantly reduce the expected runtime, which in the end may be something interesting for depending on the application. Before I conclude the presentation, I just want to uh, mention that we at OneQubit uh, implemented these two algorithms, the transpilation and the scheduling algorithms, and they are part of our software toolkit that we call as TopCAD, so, uh, which stands for Topological Quantum Architecture Design. Uh, and we hope that this uh, toolkit in the end can assist uh, researchers and businesses in the design of photo learned quantum architectures. Uh, the, just to mention like the, the scheduler is here and the transpilation would be on the circuit optimizer, optimizer part. And uh, yeah, that worked. So this is a short video because I just want to show you guys that, uh, yeah. So in this toolkit, the, whoops. Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, it's working, good. Uh, in this toolkit, the user can input a circuit, a target error bound, for example, 1% as the probability of maximum allowed probability of error uh, for running that circuit, and the parameters that characterize a qubit, such as like the, the running time, like the measurement time, uh, the, me the, the qubit fidelity and so on. And uh, our toolkit run a bunch of tools, including the scheduler and the transpiler that optimizes uh, the circuit to given a suggested fault tolerance architecture, meeting the conditions that were informed, uh, generating a resources estimate for the scenario path. So I'm not sure if I can return here the video, but in the beginning I showed that uh, here you can see that we have like the expected runtime, the number of physical qubits, and then the rest is a report showing like now where the, these qubits are, the for example the fidelities uh, of the logical circ of the logical qubit qubits and so on. So we are currently working on rounding some corners uh, before releasing TopCAD publicly. So we will release more information about it soon. If you are interested to know more about its capabilities or have any question about the, uh, the tools that I presented, feel free to contact myself. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Yeah, questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I just, it was a bit of a basic question. The last table you showed comparing pre and post transpiled. So that was like averaged over uh, yes. the, the use cases you showed before. Yeah. Um, is post transpiled better in all cases or is there maybe some reason to? No, it's uh, pre and post for the average for like all the circuits. Run I have a. Yeah, yeah, so, I, so that on average it's, that yes, it's better. on average. It, but in all average. cases, is it better? Or is there maybe some reason to... In, in all cases, it's better. So this is what I mentioned at the end of this slide. So this is what I say here. In all cases, the lower bound for the pre-transpired pre circuit is worse than the upper bound for the post-transpired circuit. So regardless, for the, again, like for the circuits that we tested, for the set of circuits that we tested, regardless of like uh, paralyzing operations or not, we can achieve like fewer logical cycles for the post-transpired circuit than optimizing everything as possible, like paralyzing everything as possible in the pre-transpired circuit. This is the main takeaway here. All right, fantastic, thank you. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, so um, I saw like in the earlier half of the presentation, you um, had these Y magic states, right, for implementing the pi over four rotations, is that correct? So those would be the pink rectangles. Um, but then later in the presentation, you used this transpilation pass to remove the pi over four rotations. Yeah. So do you still require pi over four, like these Y magic states or not in the end? Yeah, in the end, if we remove all the pi fours, these uh, pink red things are removed, so we do not need them because we do not need like any zero states. I'm just showing here because, again, for the experiments we run pre transpired circuits, so we need them. I see. For the pre transpired ones, you do still need them. Yeah. Right. But doesn't, when, when you're implementing a like multi qubit poly measurement that includes Y support, uh, even if it's pi, a pi over eight rotation, you know, those are not necessarily native in that lattice surgery. Right. So, 
like, do me a case like this that we have like why it has why support there doesn't that also require some sort of why magic somewhere or is it possible to implement that fly the lattice surgery uh, no, uh, actually, the mesh states only require Z uh, connections to the to the data qubit, so Y is not necessary for the mesh. Very interesting. Maybe you can explain that to me later. As yeah. I had a more open question, have you? So here you were very interested in routing, like positioning the, like how to use a bus, right? But did you also consider how to best position the qubits? within the data blocks in order to minimize routing or? Yes, yes. Uh, in our full algorithm, let's say like that, we also have like a matching, let's say like a, an assignment problem to decide like which data qubit should be used compared to this one. So in this example here, I just wanted to keep it simple. I'm using like one as this one here, two as this one here. But of course, like we need to solve like this uh, assignment problem if we want to actually optimize the whole thing. So yeah, is that part of your architecture? Does your that paper show how your your paper show how to do that? Or we in this paper we just mention we just use it like random assignments, so we do not explore that. But in our software, uh, we have like a more optimized way to assign the qubits. Fantastic! Yeah, I'd love to see how you guys approach that problem. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, here. Uh, thank you for a great talk. So uh, for the transpilation thing, I wonder what is the uh, pre-transpilation circuit they are trying to run, and is it optimized in any way? Or... Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, let me think I have it. From... Yeah, OK, I think I can start from here. So as I mentioned, like for this architecture, of course, we need like these uh, operations to be on the poly, um, as poly measurements. But of course, like circuits can have like different types of you know, gate set be, can be represented by different gate sets, can be, can have like arbitrary angles and all this stuff. So uh, in this paper here, we do not explore that, but in our software, we have a decomposer a step that we use to actually optimize the circuit before the, pre, uh, pre, before the transpilation algorithm in order to convert first, like re, uh, remove the arbitrary angle uh, gates using, for example, solovay kitaev uh, the uh, method to transform, you know, these arbitrary angles into the Clifford plus D gate set, and also to convert this uh, op these operations here uh, into the the Clifford plus T to the poly rotations measurement. So we the the whole pipeline does not start in the transpilation method. I just want to make this very clear. We have like three uh, steps where we optimize the circuit until we get to that point. Okay, and maybe a small follow-up question. So in the table you present, I did not see like a comparison for the T depth. So you only compare the circuit depth. So do you have an idea of the T depth comparison? Yes, uh, let me get there. Yes, T depth is here, actually on pi eight operations. Because oh, so, again, oh, I- So this is depth, this is not number. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um... This is number, right? Yeah, okay, good question, I just remember. Uh, we have in the paper, I don't have like in this table exact, the exact number, but you can see, like you could do the math by comparing this uh, depth, uh, the, the, the length here, and with the average width. So that, if you divide one by the other, that would give you the final depth for the circuit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, no other questions, if not, Let's thank all the speakers again.